Just tell me what you want. I'll tell you what I really, really want. I want a movie that isn't boring, maddening, daft, and definitely dull. That's what I want. And that's definitely not what anyone gets. Or definitely not what I got from this movie. Just tell me what you want. Which, right from the beginning, is a bad sign. That's just a terrible title. It's, a, it's, it's like the movie is mad at you. The movie's... Like, really tense and really in your face. Just tell me what you want, audience. Yeah, uh, you definitely didn't give me what I want because you apparently weren't listening or you didn't give a shit. And I'm not the only one because this only made like $2 million in the box office. It did nothing. It was a huge bomb. And it was the kind of bomb that blows up in your face. Now, the film is directed by Sidney Lumet. It's written by J. Preston Allen. And it's also based on the book of the same name by the same author. This author, this this woman, this lady, she is solely responsible, in my opinion, for the multitude of this film's sins. And the myriad of this film's problems. Because all of them go right back to its story, to its screenplay. Now, there's a few other things about it that, you know, are admittedly kind of shitty. But really... The multitude, the majority of the shit, belongs to J. Preston Allen. Now, it also features a score by Charles Strauss, cinematography by Oswald Morris. It's edited by Jack Fitzstevens. The film came out in January of 1980 on the 18th. It has a running time of an hour and fifty minute, hour and 53 minutes. God knows why. This story is not interesting or engaging or worth a shit to be in a film that's that long. This film is just plotting. It just it's such a meandering, boring movie to watch. You have a cast that's comprised of Alan King, who plays Max Herschel, who in my opinion is one of the biggest assholes on the planet Earth. Ally McGraw plays Bones Burton, which is just a weird name. What kind of name is that? The only Bones I know of is Bones McCoy. What are you doing calling yourself Bones? And uh, Ellen McGraw, this is her first role as a leading lady and her last. Understandably so, because she's not that great of an actress. At best, she's mediocre. At worst, she's about as charismatic as a piece of firewood. And, and acts about as well as one, too. Now... The main reason why I saw this, and the main reason why you're even seeing this review, is because it features a performance by a young Peter Weller. This is one of the first big roles that he got, uh, and uh, he actually manages to be one of the best things about the film. Just like he is for any movie that he's in. In fact, this movie really made me appreciate Peter Weller as an actor even more than I already do, because this is a film that is so forgettable, so dull, so boring, but each time that Peter Weller was on screen, I was somewhat captivated. I was interested. It was watchable because of Weller's performance. You saw that he gave his shit about his role. He gave it his the best that he had. It wasn't much, but he gave it everything that he had and it shows he was it wasn't a lazy performance he it, he delivered his typical unique uh, acting role you know his typical unique acting performance with the same aplomb and the same style and wit and charisma that he's brought to a multitude of other film roles and he showed you that he was a star in the making and I bet nobody who was working on the film thought that Peter Weller was the one that was going to go on to have the bigger career over Ally McGraw or Alan King. But that's exactly what happened. And if you watch the movie, you can see why. It's just, it's just a shame he wasn't in a better film. And it's also a shame he wasn't in it very much. He's only in it for like maybe 30 minutes, if that. Um, he gets an also starring credit in the opening credits. But he's not in the film that much. But I have to admit, it was worth one watch 
just to see Peter Weller, a very young Peter Weller, and uh, just to really, you know, see him work his magic in a supporting role before he would go on to get bigger roles like the lead in Robocop and films like Buckaroo Banzai and Leviathan and so on. Now, the rest of the cast consists of Keenan Wynn, Tony Roberts, Keenan Wynn plays Seymour Berger, uh, I always thought it was Seymour Butts for a second, uh, Tony Roberts plays Mike Berger, Myrna Loy in her last on-screen role plays Stella uh, Liberti, Dina Merrill plays Connie Herschel, uh, which I believe is the daughter of Max Herschel's character, Judy Kay plays Baby, and Joseph Maher plays Dr. Coulson. Now, for the most part, the cast, you know, the, none of them are really terrible, except for probably, I would have to say, Keenan Wynn is pretty bad in this. I don't know what accent he is using in this film. Whatever it is, it's terrible. It's just one of the worst accents I've ever heard in my life. It, it he sounds like acts like a fucking cartoon character. That's how bad his accent is in this film. Now I don't know what his accent is. It's supposed to be German or whatever. Like there's certain lines where his his voice goes up. I like a wing in the in the in the hospital. It's just bad. It's a bad performance. And I know he can do better. I've seen him do better in episodes of Tales from the Dark Side. And I've seen him do better in the film The Dark. Which came out like a year before this. Now, the main stars of this film are Alan King and Ally McGraw. And that's one of the film's huge failings. These two don't have any chemistry with one another. These two aren't fun to watch on screen. These two, Alan King, he does a good job playing an insufferable prick which is what he's asked to do, but he's not a likable prick. He's not a likable asshole. He's not the villain that you love to hate. And that's a huge issue because he dominates most of the screen time. So you're forced to endure and to sit through and to watch the exploits of this fucking raging asshole for an hour and 53 minutes. It's exhausting. It's, it's extremely exhausting and tiring and just frustrating. Because you're just like, can somebody just fucking get rid of this guy? Can this guy get his comeuppance already? What are they waiting? What is this movie waiting for? Uh, there's one scene in the film that is one of the only other things about the movie that I didn't mind other than Peter Weller's performance, which is a scene where Ally McGraw, in a crowd-pleasing moment, beats the shit out of Jack beats out the shit out of Alan King's character uh Herschel Mr. Herschel in public in a department store hits him wails at him with a purse she kicks him in the balls she throws him into a display he runs like a bitch out the store she chases after him keeps hitting him pounding on him until he gets back into his limo and drives away, and then she ends up getting applause from the audience. I mean, you know, including me, and not only, you know, the audience of uh, onlookers who were watching her this, this display. Now, other than that, no. There's nothing really, that, that that's the comeuppance he gets, and then there's like another thing which I'll talk about a little bit later, which is more of the comeuppance, but he doesn't really get it because ultimately he still he still has his company. He's still alive, which I don't really didn't really want him to die anyway because that defeats the purpose. I mean, when you want somebody to get their comeuppance, you don't necessarily want them to die, especially somebody like this. I want to see him suffer. I want to see him lose his business. I want to see him put in jail for all the legal shit that he's been doing. And, you know, I want to see him get run into the ground. That's what I want to see. That's what any sane person want to see after they've seen this fucking fat fuck of a fucking prick. That's what anyone would want to see. But that's not what you get. And that's not the only problem. So, yeah, this guy is not very charismatic. He's he's an asshole. He's not the he's not he's just an asshole. He's not always an asshole that you love to hate, like Dabney Coleman's character from 9 to 5, who was a really great sleazy slime ball, And you loved watching him. And that's because Dabney Coleman is funny. He has charisma. 
and the screenplay was way better. He had a lot more to work with. They, they actually did try to make this character likable, in spite of how much of a sleazebag he is. This character, Herschel, Mr. Herschel, is just an insufferable twat. That's all he is. There's nothing likable about this guy. There's nothing, oh, oh, you know, redeemable about his character. Uh, he's a misogynist. He treats his girlfriend like shit. He cheats on his wife, who is in a hospital because she has mental issues. She has some has been having some problems with a mental breakdown, and he's been cheating on her for twelve years. Uh, as soon he's doesn't treat his employees well. He treats them like dirt. He uses and abuses people. He there's just nothing redeemable about this guy whatsoever. And unlike 9 to 5, he doesn't really get his comeuppance. So what is the point? What is the point? So people are like, oh, get to the point. Okay, all right. So the, one of the main problems, probably the biggest issue this film has is its story. It's not interesting in the slightest. Okay, you you have the this this is this is pretty much the story here, folks. This is all it is, and you'll be shocked that this film is as long as it is when I tell you what the story is. So you have Bones Burton played by Ali McGraw, who is a working girl who is also the girlfriend to her boss, played by Alan King, Mr. Herschel, and he treats her like shit. And the main thing that she wants from him is for him to sell her uh, the rights and the company of a film studio that he's planning on buying out and then bulldozing to put in a, a sports stadium in its place. She wants the film studio because she wants to run a film company. She wants to run a film studio. And he refuses. Uh, and this is a character who has won like five Emmys. But apparently, no. And not only that, he bosses her around, he treats her like shit, and uh, understandably so, she eventually gets sick of it. And she gets a clue, and while she's on a sort of reconnaissance, not really reconnaissance mission, but while she's trying to woo uh, Peter Weller's character, Stephen Rutledge, who is a playwright, he's written this play that's very controversial because it's from the perspective of a terrorist. She wants to get him on her show because she has she's having a hard time getting guests on her show for some reason, even though she's won like five Emmys. Um, but she's trying to get him on her show, but he doesn't want to be on TV. So she's trying to woo him to get you know get him on her show, and ultimately she falls in love with him. She ends up breaking up with her boss now her ex she marries Peter Weller's character after the uh, uh, romantic five day getaway at uh, Peter Weller's uh, cabin in Vermont and then you're thinking okay she's she's gotten a clue now and this this is where she starts standing up for herself she beats the shit out of Herschel Max she beats the shit out of Max in a department store she ends up uh doing an expose on Herschel Industries, on uh, Stopwatch, which is kind of like a, a version of 60 Minutes, and reveals Max Herschel's dirty laundry. So it's like, okay, here's a little bit of some crowd-pleasing moments. There's some kind of, you know, uh, comeuppance for Max Herschel's character for being such a prick. All right. But then the movie proceeds to not only go off the rails, but... It also goes flying off the rails and into a dumpster that's on fire because it goes and has these batshit crazy turns in the plot that just make no sense whatsoever. And yes, they're unpredictable, but that doesn't mean they're good. And I'll, I'll talk about that later because I've seen this film get praised by some critics for some reason because it's unpredictable. It has an unpredictable ending and it's the anti-romantic comedy. I'm sorry, you shouldn't be praising an anti-anything unless it's an anti-hero. Oh yeah, this movie's not funny. It's the anti-comedy. 
and it's brilliant because it's deliberately not funny. What? Anyway, it makes the grave mistake of trying to make you sympathize with this asshole, megalomaniacal, egocentric prick character in Max Herschel. His wife of many years, who is ill, mentally ill, she dies because she chokes on some beef wellington. Okay, that's tragic. I don't know why I should feel sorry for Max, though, because he fired her doctor and sent him off somewhere and basically left her with no care in his mansion because he's a selfish prick. He's a schmuck. He and Steven Spielberg should get along just nicely. But anyway, seriously, what the hell, movie? So, try. oh, I'm sorry. I don't feel sorry for this guy. You know, she might not have died or choked on Beef Wellington if you let her still be in the care of her doctor, you fucking asshole. So anyway, even that doesn't work because of his actions. And then he sees the expose on TV, has a mild heart attack, and the, the film, it's like, I don't know what it's trying to do. So it's like it's trying to make you sympathetic for him, but then it fails on that front because then they keep showing him being, being such an insufferable asshole to everybody. He's in the hospital and he, he's giving the doctors, including a heart doctor, some shit, asking for a pacemaker, and they're just like... Can this guy just kill over and die already? Seriously, like, I, at first I was like, I don't want to wish death upon people, but this fucking character is awful. This is an awful character. I don't want to see this character anymore. Um, and then what happens next will make your jaw drop. I know it made mine drop, and it made me want to punch the movie's lights out. So, Ally McGraw's character, for some reason, is starting to feel guilty for Max's heart problems and for everything that's happened because, you know, she had the balls to stand up to this asshole who, as soon as she broke up with him, he blackballed her. He blackballed her. He banned her from things. He took her name off her, of her, you know, off of, you know, the things that she won and the things that she did for his company. She, you know, he also, he took all her assets. He seized all her assets. He basically left her with nothing and was planning on suing her for even more. And she's feeling guilty and sad and sorry. Why? She's like sitting there crying, eating fudge. I'm like, what the fuck is this? Seriously. Also, what a cliche. Seriously. She's a woman and she's emotional and she likes chocolate. Oh, come on. And if the, it does, if you think that it couldn't get any worse than that, and then she's also emotional too because she realizes that Peter Weller's big his character Stephen Stephen's big break is only because of her ex who made a deal to make it so his rival production company Cosmos Productions, ran by Keenan Wynn's cartoon character Mr. Berger, uh. He basically put up the money, so uh, the film adaptation of Peter Weller's, uh, you know, Stephen Rutledge's play can get made. So she feels guilty about that and sad or something. I don't know what the hell. And then she gets a call on the phone from uh, Max's daughter, who basically tricks her and lies to her by telling her that Max had a heart attack, another heart attack. You need to come, come to the hospital right away. She does, and for some reason, uh, you know, uh, the daughter thinks that, oh, Max and Bones make a great couple. They need to get back together. I mean, I'm like, why? They don't have any chemistry. They don't like each other. They don't, they don't respect one another. What the hell? What is, what is the point of this? And then you're thinking, like, okay, all right, she's going to hash it out with him, or, or you know, she's not going to hash it out with him. She's going to fucking demand some shit. She's gonna be like, just tell me what you want. I'm like, I'll tell you what I want. I want you to leave my husband alone. I want you to drop this lawsuit you're trying to do. I want you to give me back my assets. I want you to stop fucking with me, and I want you to leave me alone. That's what I want. That's not what happens, though. 
in some M. Night Shyamalan ding-dong type of twist, Ali McGraw's character says, I want you to tell me that you love me. Max says that says so. He says I love he says that he loves her. She returns the favor, says that she loves him after she's already made asked him for some favors. And then they kiss and make up, and then Alan McGraw narrates over the end credits pretty much. And that's the story of how I got married. Isn't it romantic? No! There's nothing romantic about this at all. There's what? What? Like you're just left there, your jaw drawed, dropped wide open. Like, yeah, I didn't see that coming, but for good reason, because that's fucking stupid. That's beyond moronic. That's one of the dumbest endings to a film I can think of, and one of the most frustrating ones. If it, it's not, it's it's bad enough that this film is already. Way too long, over long, long in the tooth, boring, and not interesting at all to watch. But now everything that I sat through is pointless. Everything. All the build up, all the drama between Max and Bones, how the relationship isn't doing very well, how Bones is treating, who's being treated like shit by her boyfriend and, and Max. Uh, the relationship that she has with Peter Weller, all of that is completely pointless, including the lines of dialogue that she said to Max earlier when she's talking about her new husband, Steven. She says, he's better than you. He's better. He's better than you. Which is true. Peter Weller is better. It's Peter fucking Weller. He's better than everybody in this film. He's better than any actor in this movie. And it shows. He's carrying this film on his back. Throughout the entire hour and 53 minutes. I'm surprised his back isn't broken after that. Because he's carried it for so long. So. I don't get it. I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense from a thematic standpoint. It's just a random twist. It's much like something you'd see M. Night Shyamalan a Ding Dong do. This is what M. Night Shyamalama Ding Dong's romantic comedy would be like. It would end with some stupid twist. Oh, hey, uh, the your lead leading lady, she gets back together with her asshole ex. Yeah, that's... Yeah, I didn't see that coming for good reason, because it's a stupid twist. All that build-up, all that shit, for nothing. Nothing! Oh, she's treated like crap. Oh, she gets back together with him anyway. Uh, Peter, she also ends up dumping, oh, she's gonna dump Peter Weller. So what about his character? What about Steven? What happens to his character? Like, what is he gonna do now? He got fucked over. For what? He didn't do anything wrong. And if she got back together with this guy because she wants the money and the power, and she's just, she's a sociopathic bitch... Then she, then they're a great match. A sociopathic bastard and a sociopathic bitch. They're a match made in hell. They can go live there. They can go burn there. And I want to send this film there. To burn for all eternity. Because it's such a pointless waste of your fucking time. Who thought this was a good idea? Yeah, I got a romantic comedy that isn't romantic and it's not funny. And it ends with an unpredictable ending, but it's an ending that nobody who was watching who was watching this movie wanted wanted, let alone asked for. And if the story isn't bad enough, the direction by Sidney Lumet is pedestrian. There's nothing to it. It's not spectacular at all. It's flat. There's nothing to this direction. I, 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 it's hard to believe that Sidney LeMay directed this. He's supposed to be such an amazing visionary director. And this looks like the work of some guy who directed some TV episode of some TV show on syndication like a couple times, got this movie, and then never directed it again. That's how unremarkable this direction is. The score by Charles Strauss is barely even in the movie, and it's so unremarkable and so bland, you might as well be playing it in an elevator. 
So the music doesn't add anything, and it's there's only like five, five scenes you hear any music in. The rest of the time, it's dead silence. Just so you can hear this wonderful, brilliant dialogue that isn't memorable and isn't funny. And then you, you just got all this other stuff that just leads a whole lot of who gives a fucking shit. And even your shit doesn't give a fucking shit if it could give a shit. And you have a movie that is not only boring, bland, dull, but frustrating and pointless. So this is definitely not a good start. And this is one of the worst, definitely one of the worst films that I've seen Peter Weller in. This is a movie that I've already forgotten about for good reason, except for the stupid twist ending, which I probably will never forget because it is unforgettably dumb. Um, but yeah, Peter Weller did the best that he could with what little he had to work with, which it wasn't much at all. Um, and he would go on to better and brighter things after this movie. I don't know what else to say about this film. Except it was a rate out of one out of five stars. One. See, I'm already ahead of myself. <laughs> I'm going to give it one out of five stars. That's for Peter Weller. And for that one scene where Ellie McGraw beats the shit out of Alan King. Which is what I wanted to do ever since I saw that fucking insufferable prick on the screen. That's what anyone wants to do watching this movie. So, just tell me what you want. It's not a film that anyone will ask for. Let alone, let alone really want. I know I don't want it. In fact, I want it out of my face. In fact, I don't want to talk about it ever again. And uh, I do not recommend this film at all. Unless you're a diehard Peter Weller fan. And you want to see a young Peter Weller in one of his first roles. And you want to appreciate him even more as an actor. By seeing him be the best thing about what is essentially a very forgettable unfunny, unromantic movie. And, you know, hey, if you want to, be my guest. But just watch the Peter Weller scenes. Watch the Peter Weller scenes. Fast forward through the rest. Trust me, you're not going to miss anything. And if you're that curious about seeing the, a young Peter Weller. Other than that, yeah, this film gets two thumbs down. Uh... Yeah, this was this was a really tough set, a really hard set, and um, yeah, it's gonna get much better from here though. So um, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the review and the rant. And as always, I will see you guys later. See ya.